good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'm here with Chip Wilson, entrepreneur in the technical apparel field. Welcome today, Chip. Ah, well, thanks for having me. It's great to be with you today. So I think a lot of the students will know a fair bit about you. You have uh, a pretty substantial reputation around the world um, to be a leader in technical apparel, entrepreneurship, so many different fields. But I think what I want to know first from you is... I've read so many times that you love to hike the grouse grind. Yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> now, I've never seen you there, so I'm not sure it's actually true, but... You're a liar. <laughs> <laughs> so, of all the hikes you've done, who has been your favorite person that you've hiked the grouse grind with? You know, I, th I this is really impossible. I would say it's more like a group. Okay. And the group has about six core people. Um, all entrepreneurs, uh, uh, from real estate to, um, you know, retail of one sort or the other. And we kind of bounce ideas off one another and kind of help each other out. So it's kind of a built in YPO EO or yeah. something like that. Yeah. But I think what's the most fascinating thing is we get the, I'd say 20 and 30 year olds coming up all the time. They've got some new idea. They want to, you know, they, they want to mentor, they want to bounce it off somebody and we all have no time. Yeah. But we do have time on the grind. Right. So we pick them up, we drive them over, we uh, talk to them about their business idea, and then and, and everyone's got an opinion on it from a bunch of different angles. And um, and then that's how we, we kind of do it. So it's not one singular person. Yeah. It's more how the group operates. So how often are you? So you're going with this core group of these six guys yeah. every couple couple times a week? or Yeah, I'd say three three times a week i mean it's it's things are you know with the COVID, of course you yeah. know the grouse was shut down and yeah. so was the tram uh, just getting back at it now so i'd say three times a week now but i'd like to do it four. yeah that's great so what's your time well when i was 40 it was 40 and now that i'm 65 <laughs> it's 67 <laughs> <laughs> so you're losing two minutes there somewhere well, yeah, with your know, age. They, yeah that's exactly <laughs> it they say you should be able to do it in your age and i'm well the COVID made me flounder but right. that's for sure <laughs> that's great so you know i've um read your book and watched lots of interviews about you over the years i live just a couple blocks from the uh lululemon uh headquarters yeah. you know some of the brands you know i'm wearing kit and ace pants right now some of the brands you've been involved with have been um huge in my life and my friends lives um and to to see the path you've gone you've made millions of decisions uh every every year to to end up where you are today can you identify like one or two very difficult decisions that you had to make that you thought you know this could make me or break me or this will change my life forever <laughs> well from a personal point of view uh i i met a fantastic woman and had two children with her but it, i wasn't in love and i and i think leaving my two children when they were one and two was definitely trumps any business decision I ever made. Yeah, uh, very very tough. Um, from a business decision point of view, it would have been uh, leaving the board of directors of Lou Lemon and uh, and then saying like this isn't fulfilling on my dreams in life and uh, and I've lost my ability to um, move it in the direction that I want and I have to take responsibility and move somewhere else where I can make it happen. Wow. So why did you leave? Well, there was a, I, th first off, when you got it, I was probably 42 when I started Lou Lemon. I was an older entrepreneur mm -hmm. and I had spent my whole life at, with this company, West Beach in the surf skate snowboarding industry. Mm -hmm. And most of my life was spent in Europe and Japan yeah. and Asia manufacturing and very little time actually at home. Yeah. So actually when I had all the knowledge of how to run retail and how to run a business, but when it blew up, I had really nobody in Vancouver that I knew. I, I actually, as, cause I'd moved to Vancouver in 86 and um, ran my business and was away. And, and so instead of um, having a group of people around me that could advise me well on what to do i i decided that maybe the best thing to do would be to sell part to private equity one to win in the united states but also to um uh to get advice on how to hire ceos as cfos mm -hmm. for billion dollar companies yeah neither of which those uh fulfilled for me right 
Um, no, I got away from the question as I often do. So <laughs> maybe you have to come back to that. Um, so what caused you to step down? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I lost control of the company basically through when I sold to private equity. At that point, I didn't think about what it was going to happen when I went public. Yeah. And and good entrepreneurs control the board of directors and and through that, the culture and the vision of the company uh, through class A and B class shares. And and so by um, having B class shares, which I could control the board, I didn't have that and I lost control of it. Right, right. So basically through that, then you end up with a, as you go public, et cetera, you end up with a group of people as directors, as nice and as good as they may be, are very metric driven mm -hmm. and don't, it's very hard to get a creative, visionary type person on a board of directors unless they own lots of the shares mm. of it. And because it's a pain in the butt, especially the U.S. public uh, directorship model, and only people that um, can sit through long, arduous metric type meetings being very and very uncreative will sit in them. Yeah. So it's kind of a self-defeating right. process. So um, inside of that, then I, I, I lost control because when you have nine directors and eight of them are metric driven and scared yeah. and basically come out of fear uh, and trying to protect shareholders existing value, except instead of making it, um, you can see where that creates a, a conflict and a need to, which makes it very hard for the entrepreneur or visionary to have a voice. Right. Wow. Um, did you view Lululemon as your baby and stepping away from it to be extremely challenging in that regard? Yes. After um, West Beach, which is my surf skate snowboard industry or business, I, you know, then it was sitting back and going, okay, there's a bunch of stuff I learned here. Yeah. Now I'm going to start the company that I always wanted to start. Yeah. And I could see from 18 years at West Beach, everything I didn't want to do and everything I yeah. did want to do. And like, like selling wholesale. <laughs> you talk about that yeah, yeah. over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah. It's the, <laughs> well, and it's been the death of every American apparel retailer in the middle of this COVID. Wow. Right? Really? I mean, it's, it's, it's killed basically uh, old, all old school companies that right. way. And I think this was just the nail on the coffin of what was happening anyway. Wow. So let's get it, talk a little bit about retail. So you have what was referred to as the six, 613 rule. Right. All right. So uh, when a customer looks at a product for six seconds, the uh, educator, mm -hmm. um, correct, say, or what people would know as a sales associate would go and speak to the customer for 13 seconds to, to speak about and educate them about the product. Right. So I think that's an interesting, very specific model. So where did that come from? And, and how did you form that that model of of selling or educating your, your customers? Well, when I was had West Beach and I had a snowboard jacket that I was making and I was selling wholesale to, um, let's call it MEC or, you know, any of the snowboard mm -hmm. shops, they would get the garment and then show it and they would have a bunch of hang tags on yeah. it. But really a lot of, so much of the technology was built into the garment that the customer couldn't see. Right. And so... The customer would look at the price, look at the garment, and it's almost a visual type of thing, which, of course, comes from fashion retailing. You look at it, decide if you like it yeah. or not. But the real value is the inherent, um, what you couldn't see. Yeah. So through West Beach then, I mean, uh, at the end of 18 years, I was making a million dollars a year off my two retail stores and losing a million dollars off of this international wholesale business. Mm. So... And I recognized that when I had people walk into my own store and buy my own product, I could tell them what it is that they couldn't see. So suddenly I could get um, $350 for a garment, which I could only get $200 from before. Yeah. So I knew there was a business model in there with, uh, with a lot more money to be made. Um, so basically my after you know spending 20 years in a retail store, you get to watch people and I, and I see what they're what their train of thought is. And I also fully understand that time is the most valuable resource. Mm. And that's what people value subconsciously more than they value anything else. Yeah. Yeah. So having people walk into our Lou Lemon store then and go, okay, they're walking around. I 
got to recognize that they spent more than six seconds in front of a garment. That means they had some pull towards it. Yeah. Now, most um, people would say, oh, I don't want your help. Because in fashion stores, it's all about fashion. It's not, oh, you know, that looks good yeah. on you or that's nice. or It's it's usually a bullshit conversation. Yeah. Um, but with technical apparel, to be able to tell someone what's in it, which they can't see, you can't ask for permission. So you have to go right in and say, this is what it is that you can't see about this garment. Yeah. Which then puts the value from $200 to $350, yeah. has someone be attached to it, buy it, larger margins. It makes the business model work. That's great. So you had c- commented on earlier, you know, the the wholesale business is getting slaughtered right now due to COVID. So yeah. what does retail look like post-COVID? What, what, where are we going to be when this is done? Or or will this type of thing never end? Like, what, what are you seeing in the future? Well, yeah, just like direct-to-consumer retail stores are bricks and mortar, it's based, basically killed wholesale because you can make a better quality product at a better price. The theory is that you should be able to go direct to e-com and make a better quality at a better price, yeah. which Amazon is proving out. Um, now, whether that works directly for apparel, I don't know. Um, definitely apparel is tactile and fit is really important. So much of what I buy on e-com I don't like because I just don't like the feel of it. Yeah, It doesn't fit right. Um, I think that... Um, um, I think where's the future of it is going is there's a there's a store in Vancouver called Turf, mm-hmm. and it was uh, started by Deanne or Delaney and Deanne Schweitzer, who were both probably our two top females at Lou Lemon, who's quit in order to set up the next revolution. So um, basically, it's a on f- there's one on Fourth and one on Georgia now. They're um, uh, they're a food, really like ultra f- organic food yeah. outlet, yeah. veggie, and uh, a workout studio. Mm-hmm. In Georgia had they have two or three of them, and then they have a retail outlet. Yeah. So because you can buy retail online, and and there's you cannot pay what the existing rents are and run a bricks and mortar store anymore yeah because um e-commerce has just taken out out too much of that yeah but if people actually have to go to the place and it's an experiential yeah. type thing where you're going for your workout you're having coffee you're meeting your best friends and then there's apparel there and then you're buying it i think that's the model of the future some type of experience like that yeah it's got to be experiential somehow right in china we we uh with my existing company we have uh you know, our, our Amherst stores, which is Arcteryx and Peak Performance, Solomon, Tomic, and Wilson, um, set up in, si- in Shanghai inside of a de- an indoor ski mountain. Wow. So it's kind of like that same kind of thing that's... <laughs> that's a whole nother level yeah, of experience. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> indoor ski mountain. I don't think we'll be seeing many of those around here in the future. Not in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> there might be some protests against that. It's global warming keeps going on. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I understand because, you know, when I buy... I love Arcteryx and, and, you know, I, and I'm a backcountry skier. And so when I buy any ski gear... I'm definitely not buying it without trying it on. Uh, And so I go to the Arcteryx store, try it on, and then go home and buy it online is often the kind of path that I take. Sure. I loved Arcteryx a couple years ago, did kind of like a a ski hut experience in the stores. And it was like you could, they had, you know, this kind of like three-dimensional experience of what it's like to go into a ski hut and the, the culture that forms and things like that. And it really created this unique experience, which to me felt authentic from being in plenty of ski huts. I've got to, like, I didn't see that, but now I've got to... Um, I think this is before you came on board that. with Arcteryx. Yeah, yeah, a couple of years ago, yeah. Yeah, you should, uh, you should, yeah, it's something that I thought was really powerful. Cool, I'll take it on. Take it on. They had yeah. the Google three, uh, 360 camera film it, mm. and uh, it, was, it was quite powerful. Mm. So how will consumers change their behavior post covid what what does the behavior of the consumer look like after this finishes up well i think we've seen past pandemics and what it's created and you know there's fear that gets created out of it and i i think you have to recognize that 30 percent of the population genetically is set in fear as a survival mechanism yeah so there will be a period of time when i i suspect three years before it gets back to total normal normalcy yeah Yeah. i mean my observation of women working out is that they love to be in the social 
setting of a very close workout area. They, I think people in general like to be in a busy, close coffee shop. I don't think these things are going to go away. Mm. I think that I can already feel that coming back. Yeah. Um, and I think people are pushing the, the boundaries, probably Americans more than anybody, because the the culture of freedom yeah. that they that it they drives want to them portray. hard. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I think it's just a, a natural three year period, which is going to be really tough on retail because the minute that you take uh, even twenty percent of sales out of, out of a retail store, even if you say e commerce was to do that. The, the retail stores are uneconomic. So mm. they were already failing before COVID. Right. Now you take another 20, 25% out. Um, n- nothing about the retail model makes sense whatsoever. Wow. Wow. So I think what's going to happen is probably by the end of this year and probably early next year, rents are going to drop dramatically. Rents are going to drop so much that I think that new businesses will start up knowing they can go back on the street, knowing that they can survive on the traffic that is out on the street. And I think the A locations, A streets, A malls are going to survive because there's something about the ambiance of right. it that has people want to right. be there. Yeah, yeah. I would like to get into talking a bit more about real estate a little bit later because I understand that that's a business that you are yeah. uh, fairly involved in these yeah. days. That's great. So what um, what brands do you see? maybe you experience yourself or, or brands that you own or brands that maybe your friends own that you think are going to handle this really well, that are well positioned to deal with the crisis and uh, come out on top? Well, I'll take my personal opinion out of it and just like, let's just look at the market cap of, of co- apparel companies in the stock market. Mm-hmm. And um, it's really, really easy to see that if you're in fast fashion or in street clothing without any technical basis to it without where where looks are more important than the actual feel and function of it you're dead in the water okay i mean the billions and billions that have been taken out of the market with those types of companies and the bankrupt bankruptcies that have occurred or what they call reorganization or whatever yeah these companies get reorganized but the fact of the matter is they're so weak after the reorganization that they really can't survive so you're talking but, like h&m zara brands like that yeah you know you look at j crew you even look at nordstrom's or you look at barney's or you look at yeah. you know all those retailers that yeah. are selling like uh what i would call instagram friendly clothing yeah. which you <laughs> which looks good yeah. on a photo but doesn't function on any kind of level okay and um, and maybe is only good to wear once or twice on Instagram, and then a girl doesn't want to be seen in it again. Yeah. Type of thing. Um, this is this is quite different from technical apparel because technical apparel has to be it's expensive by nature because yeah. of the way the fabrics, the way it's made for longevity or be, get to get beat up or yeah. to sweat in that type yeah. of thing. So these people, these companies, if you look at the market, uh, Anta in China, which is really the the Adidas Nike of China, uh, Nike and Adidas and Lou Lemon are killing it. Why? Because they've got, um, um, they own the, really the factories, the, the mills that make the fat, the, the, that make the clothing. They're experts at, those people are experts at shoes. Lou Lemon soon will be. At um, shoes? Yeah. I mean, they've, they've, uh, I can see they've hired some, uh, world-class people in shoes so i know that that's coming down the pipeline interesting um i know solomon uh and arcteryx have both moved into shoes yeah. and solomon especially in trail running um so what's what's going to survive is is these companies that are providing something that's outdoors it's healthy it feels good it works um it's it's not too fashionable it'll probably last five years because to make an athletic piece of clothing it has to last five years so you can't put too much fashion to it but you got to put enough styling into it where it's where it's classic enough to last for two years until someone really wealthy will hand it to their nanny that's basically how i put it <laughs> oh, interesting until <laughs> someone wealthy will hand it to their nanny that's great you know one thing i've always found about arcteryx is that um i love the functionality but i have always found it it's a little bit basic from a fashion perspective. Right. I'd like a little bit more style yeah, in the jackets, yeah, which I think Patagonia does, does really well. You do, bit, eh? I think they're a little bit more stylish. Yeah. You yeah. don't agree? No, I think it's terrible. 
I, I think they do a terrible job at fashion. Really? And I think Arcteryx, I, I think we recognize that at Arcteryx also. And you see that the, the problem is, is that when you sell wholesale, um, let's say Arcteryx makes a jacket for 200 and they wholesale it for 400 yeah. and then, I don't know, MEC or REI sells it for 800 Yeah. That's a really expensive jacket. Yeah. And so to be able to, to put fashion or style into it is really tough because I think the where they come from is the person that's been able to buy that in the past would go, okay, in order for $800, I need to wear that for about eight years yeah. to, to, to pay for it. And um, But what I found at Lululemon was when I could avoid the wholesaler and I could have that $200 jacket then sell for $500, yeah. then I could start to put styling into it because then people could say, I can justify $500 every three years. Yeah. And that, they could put more style into it. Yeah. That, that's great. I mean, that that leads me into kind of the next topic of conversation. Before I get into your channel structure, are you looking to change Arcteryx to move it out of wholesale? Well, I don't think I would have bought it unless I, you know, with my partners, unless yeah. I would have seen that as as the venue for the future. I don't think this is this is like a secret of any sort. Like, I think if you're, I mean... You'll notice the one company I didn't mention and who's falling is Under Armour. Totally a wholesale company. Yeah. Totally set up on throwing their logo on anything that, you know, they don't even care what it is. And it's an Instagrammable, what I'd call, like, built-on um, um, image, not re- not reality and analytics, yeah. and they're dying. I remember you had um, an ad in the bus stop in front of Lululemon mm-hmm. uh, saying that it was undervalued and that it should be bought. Yeah, and that course, Lululemon should buy it. Yeah, I mean, there was a time and a place for that. Yeah. And the time and the place was that when Under Armour really uh, had a male uh, crowd. What am I saying here? Because it's a wholesale built on image, it had the what I'd call the under 18 year old boy who's trying to buy an image because they don't know how to actually be something. They don't know how to talk to a girl. Yeah. So they try to like buy a logo that will tell the girl what they are. <laughs> and then that's also built, I'd say, for 40 year, 40 year old men and over who are insecure and want to be young again <laughs> and don't know how to do it. So that's but great. It, but it, but they had they had the the basis for it at the time, which I think when you put a Lululemon female brand with a Under Armour brand, at the time, it would have it could have uh, come up against Nike and Adidas really easily, um, but you know I think uh, Kevin Plank was you know very, very masculine and very kind of you know uh, I don't think really understood the psyche of women really wasn't willing to move into that yeah realm. yeah so when we look at um... So can you maybe just explain to those watching this channel structure that you set up with Lululemon to move out of wholesale and maybe a bit of background of how West Beach was based on that. You've kind of touched on it, but yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe explain the, the, the process here. Well, let me tell you a story about the black lycra tight of Lou Lemon. <laughs> that yes. probably is the easiest one. So in the last few years at West Beach, I decided to go into women's um, uh, snowboard clothing. So as a first layer, I made this this pant and I made it out of this like most amazing fabric I'd ever seen. It was a, it was a nylon, so it didn't stink. And it was, uh, it felt like cotton, which I'd never felt a, a kind of a petroleum based, like, you know, like nylon, like yeah. polyester, whatever that felt like that. Yeah. So I, um, I went, wow, this is really neat. And this is really expensive fabric. And so I made, I, I, I put it in my line, I sold it wholesale, which meant like, let's say I made it for 30, I wholesaled it for 60 to the snowboard shops and then sell it for 120. Well, only 100, and, no, only 57 sold worldwide. Mm. So I went, okay, well, that's a failure. But those 57 women hounded me relentlessly for, they want, you know, I think they knew it was special. I think their boyfriends probably knew it was special, although I wasn't really thinking that way. And so I went, God, you know, the demand for that is like, like I've never felt anything like that. And then I knew that through my own retail stores, if I didn't sell it 
wholesale, then if I made that pant for 30 and I could sell it for $90, I said, I can sell a ton of these, you know, and this is the demand is obviously there. So when I started Lululemon, that was the premise of it. Then, yeah. Like I had to get rid of the wholesale pricing in order to make a superior a superior product that everyone want at a price where people would buy it in volume. You also talk about the buyers in the wholesale world really having an influence on um, past styles, like the, right. the former is driving their buying habits. Right. Because and it even happens. I saw it happen at Lululemon. I see it happen in all the companies. And it's the way the structure of the incentive system is set up for buyers. And that is that they, um, they're they on yearly bonus and they're, they're, they have to meet a margin and they have to meet sales in order mm. to get their bonus. So their, their ability to risk is very, very low. All they really want is a little bit of a, a different rendition of what they already know is going to sell. Yeah. So they can't, um, they can't stand in nothing, mm. which I kind of call amnesia, and reinvent their business. Yeah. Which is why new businesses, Tesla, Apple, Blue Lemon, always come around all the time because you get old school thinking involved in security and safety. Yeah. Yeah. So will will brick and mortar last through COVID for those brands that are, you know, um, in technical apparel? Well, places like Lou Lemon were perfectly situated because we got into um, bricks and mortar at, at a later stage than, let's say, the Gap or J. Mm-hmm. Crew or people like that, where we really didn't have enough stores, maybe about 500 worldwide, which was just enough to have women know their size and to know the quality of it mm. and to be able to talk verbally with other women, like... Because when you get when you get a recommendation from a friend about something, your ability, your propensity to to buy it and buy in volume of it right off the bat is really really high. So um, we had enough women, critical mass, I'd say, talking yeah. about it with yeah. validity and authenticity that it made it really easy for women to buy a lot, even when they went on e-commerce. Yeah. Because I think the problem with the e-com is. Uh, you know, people will buy all sorts of sizes, test everything out, and then it's the, the cost of shipping back, re, you know, looking at the quality of everything when it gets shipped back, restocking it, all that is immensely expensive. Yeah. But I think Lou Lemon probably has the least in the world uh, returns. Really? And I think uh, what people don't really know is that because when you have 17 to 23% lycra built into your garments, even a size up or a size down, well, you know, people's propensity to send it back is slim. And wow. I think we have enough people uh, in the garments now where they know their size. Right. So there's, so that because they know their size, they're just less likely to send it back because they're just going to order what they know is going to fit them. Yeah. And when you, when you have Lycra in the clothing, yeah. it's just, you know, even when you it's put forgiving. something on, it's super forgiving. Yeah. So what brands do you wear? Well, uh, like what right- are we wearing here today? <laughs> Maybe we should get you to turn around and. <laughs> well, it's it's uh, it's the middle of summertime, yes. so I would say my my big problem is is my my brands that I've bought through Ammer, which are the ones I mentioned, are mostly uh, mountain yeah. brands, yeah. And, and one of the big opportunities, of course, I have to deliver to them is summer, spring, summer, right, and women's, yeah, which I'm not a woman, so I should, can't really talk about that right now. <laughs> But uh, I'm wearing uh, Anta shoes. So Ant is my partner in China. Yeah. Um, they have like something like um, a 1,500 Fila stores, and I don't know, like 10,000 Anta stores in, in China. It's, it's wow. an unbelievable machine. <laughs> and um, so. Um, and they're your partner to buy Ammer, is that right? Yeah, exactly. They're okay. 51%. Tencent was 10%. Yeah. And uh, a private equity firm is 20%, and I'm 20%. There's. I'm sure that's not 100%, but you get the idea. That's the ownership of Amber. Right, right. And then I'm wearing um, someone's socks. I don't know. I think <laughs> I, I go trekking a lot, and I get given free socks. I'm, um, what underwear am I wearing today? <laughs> this um, is getting for real I don't here. know. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, uh, I don't like boxer underwear because I sweat so much. I'm, I'm a tidy whitey guy. But yeah. I mean, I've just got big, big legs, and I don't know how people wear boxers. But anyway, I don't. I'm wearing kitten shorts and I'm wearing a Lou Lemon t-shirt. Excellent. Well, you're representing well. I am. Is that your? Is that a? Is that a good cross section of your wardrobe? These brands? Yeah, for spring summer it is. Yeah. Um, because again, you know, like you catch me here now in a year and a half or 
and I'll be wearing probably Arcteryx and Peak and Solomon and yeah. Wilson. Excellent. Wilson, I think, is is a really big opportunity. Where, what's the opportunity with Wilson? That would be out of the brands that you own. Yeah, the yeah. one I'm probably least familiar with, aside, I had a Wilson baseball glove probably when I was a kid. Yeah, or something, yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. You know? Well, I think it's the all American brand, and if you look at you know companies like Tommy Hilfinger or Ralph Lauren Polo, who would have been seen as the American apparel brands, yeah. Wilson has only done equipment, yeah. and they've done a couple of things with apparel, but they it's not their they don't understand it at all. So by buying it and being able to put the business model, which I have for apparel into Wilson, I think it can become the American, the new American brand, so wow. to speak. And however Tommy Helfinger or Polo did worldwide, I think uh, Wilson will expand that by 10. I only say expanding it by 10 because again, the there is maybe hundreds of hundreds thousands of of uh, fashion streetwear brands but only a limited number of technical apparel brands yeah because you have to really understand mm. it's a different type of manufacturing yeah different again fabric mills different different uh factories yeah. and different ways of selling wow interesting that's great 